Welcome to the art of 14th century Europe. With this lesson, we're going to talk about the art in Europe from the year 1300 to 1400, give or take. Um, in the, this time period, things began to shift rather dramatically in Europe and the foundation was laid for what would become the Renaissance. And the Renaissance really started right at about the year 1400. Now before we talk about the big picture in Europe, let's talk about one particular painting, the smaller picture, so to speak. This is a mural at the Palazzo Publico in Siena, and it was commissioned by a group of politicians called the Council of Nine. They were city leaders who commissioned this fresco in the place where they met. Now it's painted by a man named Ambrogio Lorenzetti, who is a well-known painter of the, era, of the era, really sort of a, a rock star of a painter at the time. Now while this is amazing simply because it's been preserved in fairly good condition, what's really interesting about it is the level of symbolism. And this symbolism was probably created by philosophers, and thinkers other than the artist himself. He was probably given these ideas to illustrate. So here what we have is the two ways of governing personified. On the one hand we have good government which is personified with um, figures representing concord, justice, peace, strength, prudence, temperance, and magnanimity. Do you know what magnanimity means? like magnanimous. It means sort of, can't we all just get along? Okay, So there we have good government. And then on the other hand, bad government, which is personified by tyranny, a figure of tyranny surrounded by cruelty, treason, fraud, fury, division, and war. Well, you know, if you stack those two uh, lists of terms against each other, I think we'd probably go for the former rather than the latter, one would hope. So what this uh, mural really does is it asserts, it states, the relationship between secular rule and divine authority, which has been something that's been really shifting in Europe during the whole Middle Ages. You know, we had the Eastern Byzantine Empire, where the secular and the religious were very closely intertwined. And then we have the Roman Catholic branch of things, where it was a little bit more divided and yet the church held great authority and had great influence on government. Now within a decade after the painting of this mural, Siena would be devastated by the Black Plague and Lorenzetti himself probably died from the plague. Yet this vision of progressive idealism is a good place to start as we look at the changes in art of this century. Now one more note, which you may have already noticed, is look at the doors, okay? That's how big this mural is. It's a very large and dramatic mural. So now that we've looked at one particular painting in Siena, let's look at the biggest picture of all, all of Europe. Well, you know, we do have the rest of the world to consider, but for this lesson, we're looking at Europe. Now one of the things to, there's several things that we're going to look at in this century in Europe. Throughout Europe, there was a cultural expo explosion, and we had literary luminaries such as Dante and Chaucer and, and many other great poets. Um, uh, the greatest poet of the day was named Petrarch. And then we have artists such as Giotto, uh, Duccio, Simbiu, and several others that, that began to change the way that art was both considered and created during this time. There was a lot more naturalism, less stiffness in the figures. They looked a lot more believable. And the real master of this was Giotto. He would be the artist that I would say, if I wanted you to remember one artist from this time period, that would be him. But we'll be talking about him a lot in this lesson. Now, one of the things that made the arts flourish was a change in culture. As the wealthy classes grew and part of being wealthy was that you would use some of your riches to support the art. This was fashionable. So wealthy patrons would um, commission works in churches or in their homes or at guilds, guild sites where different craftspeople and merchants gathered. And this really helped to support artists because they were getting money for their work. That always helps. Now 
At the same time, we, have, we do have this underlying disaster called the Black Plague, which actually killed up to 40% of the population. And this upbeat map that we're looking at actually shows the spread of the Black Plague at various years during the mid-1300s. And you can see it really swept through all of Europe. You can find this map, if you want to read the fine detail, on page 532 in your textbook. Now first, let's look at a very old, solid building. And to get to this, let's talk a bit about how medieval cities were constructed, how they were laid out. They were usually surrounded by walls with clusters of houses around a sort of town square. And the wealthy people would build large towers, uh, both to defend, to see out of the walled city, but also to show their status. Now this one uh, is in Florence, what we're looking at. And it took about 11 years to build. On There's two things that I'd like you to notice here. First, we have the Piazza de, de Signoria um, with the town hall, which is the big building with the clock tower, 300-foot tower. That's pretty amazing. When I look at this, I think about the workmen that were stacking those rocks up that tall in the air in, you know, around the year 1300, 1305. So this is a, a, just an amazing work of art and art of architecture and engineering in its own right because it is still standing. Now over to the right there's a covered area that they used for public presentations so people could gather out of the elements in more of a defined space and this was built um, oh a few years later about 75 years later. So here we're looking at Florence and we'll also look at Siena in today's lesson. At another location in Florence we have the Florence Cathedral and here we're looking at the baptistry doors, the doors to the baptistry, which is adjacent to the Florence Cathedral. Now these doors are significant for several reasons. There was another set of doors that look pretty much like these doors, except for they have different pictures on them, that were uh, commissioned in the year 1400. And the other set of baptistry doors are considered to mark the beginning of the Renaissance. Ah, but let's back up to these doors. They were created by the artist and Andrea Pisano, and they depict the life of John the Baptist. Now, these are all very interesting to me because if you look at it from a compositional standpoint, it's a little hard to tell what's going on. But if we look at just one of them, you can see that each is a work in themselves, a fine composition in its own right. They're made of bronze with gold, with gilding, with gold um, uh, attached to the bronze. Now here we have the baptism of the multitude, and it's by it's Saint John the Baptist baptizing a bunch of people. What is interesting about this is look at how the mountains are depicted in the background. Notice how the gold brings the figures forward and how the artist has created a further sense of a three-dimensional sort of a feel by the folds of the fabric, by the way that, that he created those. So now let's talk a little bit about the painting of the era and how it evolved. And the first thing we're going to do is make a very famous comparison between two artists, Cimabue and Giotto. So first let's look at this altarpiece by Cimabue. Who, this is 12 feet tall. Okay, so this is kind of ginormous altarpiece. Now it's called Virgin and Child Enthroned. The first thing we'll notice, perhaps, is that all of the figures seem in a way sort of stiff and stylized. But you can also notice that the throne is a kind of an architectural piece. It takes a lot of space in the composition. And Mary has gold in the folds of her drapery. That might be a little bit hard to see here, but that's something to notice. Also notice the way that the perspective, oh, in some ways, is very flat. I, I could almost say it doesn't exist, but there's always some kind of perspective. Like if you look at the bottom, it looks like you're looking straight on at the people. If you look at Mary, straight on at Mary. So this is a, actually rather revolutionary for its time at the end of the 13th century. It was painted in 1280. But this artist, Chimabue, according to the story, actually discovered 
the artist Giotto. When Giotto was a young boy at his uh, father's, herd, uh, tending his father's sheep herd, he was drawing. And according to the legend, Giotto was drawing with a stick in the dirt. And Cimabue came along and saw him and took him to train him and created this artist, one of the greatest artists of the period and who is an artist who is really considered to be one of the forefathers of the Renaissance. So this is his virgin and child enthroned. And you can see that Mary looks a lot more naturalistic, especially if you look at the angels on either side of Mary. They're more um, in perspective. They're sort of one behind the other instead of them being stacked up. Now let's just look at them together, shall we? Okay, so here we have on the left and on the right. Um, let's see, the other thing to notice here would be that the, the throne on the right is much less imposing, it's a lot more delicate. Now one of the interesting things about Giotto was that he is uh, the first artist, the first major artist to really paint in a naturalistic style. Now he was also a follower of St. Francis who really worshipped the natural world. There's probably a connection between those two um, things. And Giotto also went on to paint frescoes in many Franciscan chapels. In uh, the early 1300s, Giotto was called to Padua in northern Italy to paint these scenes on the Arena Chapel. Now when we look at it with our modern eyes, it might look a little bit busy or sort of uh, hard to see as a unified whole. But what we're going to do is to look a little bit at the individual images that are painted on the wall. But first, let's talk about this story of this chapel because it's kind of interesting. It was commissioned by a man named Enrico Scraveni. And he and his family, they made their fortune with what was called usury at the time. And what usury was, simply, was charging interest for loans. Now, that's not anything today, but at the time it was considered a sin. And in fact, it was not even, you know, so he, these, this family's um, background and means of a livelihood was considered just a mortal sin. They were all going to hell. But this guy, he covered his bases. He built a chapel right next to his home to somehow atone for his sins. And you know what? He got pardoned by the Pope. So he was probably okay in the long run, according to his beliefs. Now, uh, let's look instead. Now we've, so now we know the background. It was the, the money lender uh, appeased for his sins and commissioned this chapel. The chapel's pretty simple on the outside, but the inside is just um, incredibly done. Now, this guy had a lot of power because he was able to commission two of the most important artists of the day, one of them being Giotto and the other a man named Giovanni Pisano. Let's look more closely at what's going on here. Here we have four scenes from the life of Christ, and I'll run through them quickly because they're interesting to me. We have Jesus changing water to wine in the upper left. Uh, let's see, raising Lazarus from the dead on the right, and on the lower left we have the death of Jesus, and on the right, the resurrection. Now notice the inter intricate patterning between these images too. They really bespeak of uh, the style of the era. I also want you to notice things like um, the architectural elements in the water to wine scene in the upper left. Notice how it has a sort of a ceiling fixture that's in perspective and has cast shadows. Okay, this is new. This is revolutionary. For now, we'd think, oh, no big deal. But what if nobody had done that before? And along comes Giotto, and everything changes. So this is one of his more famous images. Um, it's called The Kiss of Judas. And I invite you to look at the easier to see version on page 642 in your textbook. But what we have here is um, Jesus is being arrested. There's all the soldiers. Uh, Peter is standing behind Jesus, cutting off the ear of a soldier while somebody grabs at his robe. But one interesting thing, a compositional element, is how the artist has made all these big um, uh, masses of basically drapery 
that keep us from really seeing all the chaos that's going on. Now, this is pretty smart because